Um, Jason Yu is a pharmacist, traditional Chinese medicine herbalist, and he's the coordinator for Herb Information Center at the Integration Medicine Service here at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. He holds a doctor of pharmacy degree from the State University of New York SUNY School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, and he completed a postgraduate year one community pharmacy residency both in Buffalo, New York. He has a Master of Science degree from New York College of Traditional Chinese Medicine, and he's a diplomat of Oriental Medicine, board certified in the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. Jason is a registered pharmacist and a licensed acupuncturist in New York State. His expertise is in the use of dietary supplements and botanical products. Because so many cancer patients use herbal supplements, there's an urgent need for reliable information on herb drug interactions. Jason applies his experience in the areas of pharmacy and botanicals to consult and educate patients and other healthcare professionals about the proper use of herbs and supplements. As you know, this is a topic that all of us are extremely interested in. So we're actually thrilled that we have the opportunity to learn about it today. So Jason, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you and thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, everyone able to see the screen? Okay, good. All right, so thank you Renee and Lisa for inviting me um, to talk about this uh, very important topic on safety, on herbal use and just in general and specifically for the Ross Wonders like you are. Um, so um, as a coordinator um, of um, the About Herb uh, website, as well as the Herbal Dispensary Program Manager at Memorial Sloan, I uh, educate the um, various clinicians as well as the patients regarding uh, proper herbal dietary supplement and uh, their use and of course, um, uh, give them knowledge on how potentially uh, herb drug interaction can occur, okay? Um, and this is particularly important for cancer patients who have uh, changing supporting care needs before, during, and even after the treatments, okay? The, and the popular idea that natural products are safe is a uh, persistent theme that can lead to unintended problems, especially when combined with active treatments in oncology settings. So the prevalence of herb and dietary supplement use is high, especially among cancer patients. We know that at least 60% may take two or more dietary supplements every day. Uh, it's very important uh, for a patient to uh, disclose and discuss these uses with their oncology team. But uh, this has been uh, been in studies in scientific community community that we know uh, for various reasons this may not occur. Especially we know there's a lack of time during appointments, um, or there might be discussing more pressing issues or acute issues, and believing that natural product is safe, so why mention it? And the feeling that healthcare professionals probably don't know much about the supplements anyways, okay? Um, so an excess of information and misinformation at our fingertip also acerbates this dynamic. And there's quite a bit that we don't know, especially about these supplements and, and they're very poorly regulated. And limited clinical information may not even have uh, data on uh, potential herb drug interactions or adverse events, okay? Products may also be studied in different populations such as healthy individuals or non-cancer patients with other diseases or use several different forms of uh, botanical cross studies and many of these studies are too small in size, uh, all factors that may result 
not necessarily applicable to cancer patients. Uh, of course, it is natural to want to do something for oneself and many patients are trying to address difficult symptoms or improve their quality of life just to get through the days or lingering concern about uh, you know, preventing reoccurrence. Perhaps you already see something on this list uh, for which you heard a supplement could be helpful for. Um, so uh, this is why we need to adapt uh, the safety first strategy uh, when we talk about using supplements in cancer populations, okay? So is the product standardized? Most products aren't. So it's important to compare potency, okay? Is the product well absorbed? Okay, without absorption, there's no benefit. okay? Does the product really function the way it's marketed, okay? Uh, or the perceived benefits lacking scientific evidence. Most products have scant evidence, okay? Does the product contain unlisted toxicity uh, ingredients? Um, many products may contain things such as heavy metals, microbes, or unknown substances. okay? And lastly, does the product interact with various medications, okay? Interactions often un underreported unidentified or not studied, okay? So as, health, as a healthcare professional, there's often a need to educate patients that perceived safety is just that, a perception. And although there are herbs and supplements that can be helpful for, uh, to cancer patients under certain conditions, we have criteria such as uh, randomized control trials that are needed so we can assess these claims, okay? And just as important, make sure that the product is safe and uh, avoid unintentional results. Uh, so uh, it's, it's with these issues uh, in mind that the About Herbs database was uh, being developed and maintained. Uh, it is important resource for both clinicians and patients. It's currently contained 288 monographs on popular and traditional use of herbs and supplements uh, of particular interest to cancer patients. Uh, their current evidence include potential mechanisms, adverse events, and interaction associated with each herb. And we regularly uh, research the PubMed database to update the monographs to change in, uh, for changes in evidence. Uh, we also have a subject section on the mind-body therapies, uh, several of which uh, comes from traditional medicine practices and for which there are often highly level of uh, evidence for safety and efficacy, such as acupuncture, uh, exercise. So when we talk about supplement safety, it's uh, usually broken down into several categories of interaction that should be considered, particularly with uh, um, complicated and lengthy treatment regimens and other medical concerns that may coexist with, for uh, cancer patients, okay? Typically, there inter uh, there's an interaction that can fall into four big categories. Although these are, uh, there are others, but the main ones are antioxidants, blood thinning, hormonal effects, and immuno uh, immune stimulating effects. Now, uh, right off, we heard great uh, how great antioxidants are, uh, and um, sometimes um, it's being heavily marketed. And there are, you know, there are products out there that you probably can associate antioxidants with um, in 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 your in the back of your head. Uh, and of course, many foods contain antioxidants and varied diets to obtain not just that, but many uh, other compounds that supports our health is generally the way to go. Certainly some patients may have dietary restrictions or absorption problems, and those needs to be addressed, but um, with healthcare provider or identify a true cause and resolution. But as a general example, antioxidant can 
also act as pro-oxidants or in, ele uh, or in elevated level may interfere with various cancer treatments um, like um, alkylating agents or chemotherapy. Okay. Um, there are other groups um, that you may recognize here is uh, bloodthinning herbs, um, perhaps some, uh, perhaps from getting a list of supplement to take before surgeries. So these are these are ones that we definitely would recommend you stopping. <laughs> um, if if you recognize these and you are about to have surgeries in MSK, we actually want people to stop all supplements one week ahead. Uh, but specifically things like garlic, you know. Um, uh, fever feel, you know, sometimes you have to know these are potential uh, blood thinners. Um, and then uh, um, so there are less known to general public the category, categories like phytoestrogens, so plant compound with hormonal characteristics that can affect hormonal therapies or immuno stimulants that may interfere with immunosuppression uh, medications. Um, so, so the key here is we are seeking to avoid unintended or unwanted side effects um, that can either lose the drug efficacy or increase drug toxicity, okay? As you can see from this chart, uh, there are numerous opportunity for potential drug interactions. The table has botanicals that are commonly associated with uh, uh, herb drug interactions or side effects. Because adverse events are often underreported, this list is likely to grow with literature basis. And again, it is important to know it is usually the supplements rather than the food that cause these interactions because of the concentrated uh, dosing. For example, it's unlikely that you will suffer a herb drug interaction with normal dietary intake of soy. Uh, at some time, at the same time, uh, there may be specific dietary uh, interactions and we'll get to those in a moment, okay? So uh, when we look into herb drug interactions with respect to targeted therapy like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, it really helps to remember the main goal is uh, in, in cancer treatments, okay? Uh, we came a long way with the targeted therapy, drugs like uh, chrysoptinib and ectrectinib are used to address rare and difficult cancers. So the top line goals are ensure that drugs works as intended and the patient can tolerate the treatment and avoid uh, what might uh, interfere with the drug efficacy and safety. Okay, so this means either staying away from herbal supplements or using them cautiously uh, and with healthcare professionals uh, guidance because the, the data for most on safety or efficacy with uh, tyr tyrosine kinase inhibitors or TKIs is lacking. Still, it is important and helpful to understand why what you ingest matters, um, particularly as a cancer patient on treatment. And here I'm going to discuss broad terms, what is uh, known as uh, pharmacokinetics or how drug move within the body, okay? Uh, we inherently have a complex system that is designed to automatically get rid of waste. So toxicity doesn't build up. Uh, even water similarly benign can be toxic if overconsumed in a short period of time. This is known as water intoxication, where electrolytes are so diluted, the body just stop working properly. But luckily, we don't need to think about how to get rid of waste. Uh, however, knowing how your body reacts to what you put in it um, can help you make mindful choice about uh, what to eat or take as a supplement and avoid excessive, uh, uh, excessive stress to the body. 
Uh, TKIs use specific mechanism called the SIP enzyme, uh, SIP enzyme system in the liver uh, to metabolize the drug. Okay, it is essential to uh, it is essential how it, it it is essentially how the drug is detoxed from the body. Okay, SIP stands for cytochrome P450, a super family of protein enzymes. Uh, there are many subtypes within the SIP enzyme system, and TKI need the 3A4 subtype to help the body get rid of the drug. So why is this important? 3A4, SIP 3A4 metabolizes up to 50% of all marketed drugs, not just TKIs, statins for cholesterol drugs, proton pump inhibitors, PPIs for GERD, for acid reflux, and even some antibiotics um, like ketoconazole. Um, and it's, it's not only drugs, many herbs and botanicals, even fruit juice, okay, may use CYP384. Uh, um, I don't know if people know which fruit juice I'm referring to, but um, yes, there's one fruit juice that um, probably you guys all know to avoid, okay. Uh, so this is the story behind grapefruit juice, okay? And how it clinically, it, it is a clinically relevant interaction with drug. Uh, and um, grapefruit juice could alter drug metabolism was a serendipitous discovery. Researchers were studying how the effectiveness and safety of philopatine. Uh, it's a drug for hypertension, philopatine and uh, was affected when taken with alcohol, okay? And they used grapefruit juice as a placebo for this uh, comparison. Um, now, alcohol did uh, affect the way drug uh, function, cause more side effects like lightheadedness due to hypertension, but plasma or blood concentration of philopatine uh, in the placebo or grapefruit juice group was surprisingly high. Uh, when in a uh, follow-up study, use either grapefruit juice or orange juice, grapefruit juice tripled the bioavailability of nifedipine, another high blood pressure drug, uh, compared with uh, those who consume a uh, drug with water, okay? And the side effect caused by, uh, are caused by the greatly increased amount of drug in the bloodstream because of the grapefruit juice is preventing the drug from being metabolized, okay? And orange juice has no such effects. So this indicates a particular compound in grapefruit juice uh, was responsible. And furanocumarins were identified as the compound that inhibits, okay, the SIP enzyme. So 10 years after that, um, we identify more drugs that has adverse events when taken with grapefruit juice, something like the calcium blockers, uh, lodipine, benzodiazepine like midazolam, okay? So these are basically drugs that can potentially interact with food, you know, or, or drink, fruit juice. So there are two main ways in which SIP enzyme can be affected, uh, induction, or inhibition, okay? So um, type of product that exert effect uh, can, can be drugs, herbs, and botanicals. And as we know, even fruit juice, okay? Uh, SIP 3A4 lives in both the liver and intestine. And um, this is where induction and inhibition of SIP enzyme occur, okay? So if an, herb induces three, uh, the CYP3A4, it may de decrease the um, blood level of the drug, okay? Um, one such example is how St. John's war can affect the serum level of irinotecan, a chemo uh, for colon cancer, um, where this interaction can neg negatively impact the treatment outcome, okay? And if an herb inhibits CYP3A4, 
it can increase the absorption or, or basically de decrease the amount of drug being broken down and which are the increase in the drug can cause toxicity, okay? And uh, one example is uh, the grapefruit juice, okay? So um, what does inhibition look like, okay? Generally, the SIP inhibition, uh, SIP inhibitors, it basically locks up the uh, machinery that can break down the drug, including TKIs, okay? Uh, which lead to drug buildup and increased toxicity and adverse e effects. Okay, uh, these common adverse events for uh, these uh, these are the most common adverse events on the table. Uh, mostly consider grade one or grade two, but uh, however, a sub uh, a substance that inhibit the appropriate SIP enzyme could make these symptoms worse when uh, expected or uh, potential lead to drug dis discontinuation, okay? Drug inducers, however, behave the opposite way uh, with increased elimination of uh, co-administered drug because it increases the CYP384 activity, okay? When there are more of these enzymes around, more drug get detoxed making it uh, spend less time in the body, therefore less available to take effect. Uh, this would include TKI and help stop ROS1 um, positive um, uh, tumor growth, okay? So this increased elimination can lead to significant reduction in the effectiveness or a complete loss of efficacy of the drug that you're taking to treat your cancer. And once again, St. John's World is one of such herb in this category of SIP inducers. Uh, many other herbs and botanical commonly used for various conditions have been identified that either inhibit or induce SIP 3A4. So at this point, you might be wondering how can you make sen sense of all of this, if at all? Um, uh, let's give some context to this knowledge. Most HDI uh, or herb drug interaction data is preclinical, which means it was discovered in a lab experiment or using cells or animals. In some incidents, the study products may be in a concentration that are too high. Uh, it might not be relevant to human. Rather, such studies usually indicate a potential for an interaction. Uh, there's a present need for, um, to continue studying these food and herbal extracts to find dosages at which such interactions are clinically relevant, especially uh, since the line continues to be even more blurred with uh, newfangled products like nutraceutical and functional foods available in the market now. Uh, which comes to returning to the why. Why supplements? Uh, it's important to get to the root of a symptom. And we really want to encourage you to speak to your healthcare provider. Okay. Have an honest and open conversation on your supplement use. So they can be properly uh, assessed through their risk and benefit ratio. Um, uh, as cancer patient, it's commonly um, it's common to assume you are supplement deficient, and supplement marketing usually amplifies such claim. But a personalized uh, symptom assessment by your healthcare team is what's needed to determine whether this is uh, oh. this in fact true and better uh, and best approach and find the best approach for it as your. Um, as our mind about mind and body monograph described, there are many modalities that uh, can be tried first before you need to start supplements. Uh, and that may mean one less pill to begin with. So I kind of scrolled too fast and um, we have some time for questions and 
answer session. I can, I guess I can begin with the list that Lisa gave me, right? Okay. So um, my first question is, what would be a good supplement for energy? Okay. So this, I would want to know, like, um, so before I tell you what specific herbs, uh, everyone is different, okay? So not every uh, herb under the sun can basically be used to treat, you know, a particular symptom without really assessing the individual first, okay? So it's really good that you want to bring this concern up with the healthcare provider or your uh, oncology team to find out why you have such lack of energy. Is it because you're not sleeping or is it because um, whatever, um, like just you probably just need the, a little bit of energy to get through the day. Um, sometimes um, from a traditional Chinese medicine point of view, there's patterns that we have to recognize. And um, specifically for energy or uh, potentially like if you have a fatigue problem, okay, we have three formulas um, to address these uh, specific symptom, okay? So, I mean, it can range from, you know, a, ging uh, a ginseng base formula to a stragulus base formula to a, a different um, formula where we address stress more uh, than, than trying to boost the, boost the energy. So when, when I get a question like, oh, what's good supplement for energy? I really want to really uh, know what's the underlying cause, okay? But of course, there are supplements such as ginseng, astragalus, um, green tea even. Um, so depending on your need and what is the underlying cause that could really uh, weigh out the risk and benefit. Okay, I hope I answered that question, but uh, it's really between the healthcare team and you and everyone is different. And um, you can potentially go to our About Herbs website and type in the particular supplement and see if there's any interactions with TKIs, you know, and um, that's probably a good way to open a conversation up with your team, okay? What would be a good supplement to repair myelin sh sheath? So myelin sheath is basically fats, okay? So um, a food source for healthy fat, fatty acid would be the way to replenish um, myelin sheath, okay? But that's also, we have to rule out any potential, um, you know, why, why is there a degradation of myelin sheath in the first place? We have to figure out, we have to rule it out, you know? Maybe um, potentially you can um, find out um, and rule out whether th is there any hereditary disease underlying this de degradation. But um, I would want to know why, why you want to be that specific to try to uh, repair myelin sheath in the in the first place. Okay. So. Is there an effective herb against edema? Yes, there are. But in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, edema has many types, you know. Um, and there are very effective drugs for like those pitting edema in the egg, legs, you know. Um, but there are um, a specific type of edema that can cause dizziness, okay. And we have a traditional Chinese formula that's based off from a medicinal mushroom, fuling, that can help uh, leach out the, 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 the fluid that's building inside of you, specifically in the, in, the, in the year. So different type of edema has different uses of herbs. And 
um, we we want to recognize what pattern or what specific edema you're talking about. Okay, but yes, of course, there are uh, supplements for edema. Okay, so so anything for fatigue or mood or uh, management? Yes, fatigue and mood is a very specific um, co uh, combination, a pattern that in traditional Chinese medicine we use a formula called Xiao Yao San. Okay, Xiao Yao San. We have a monograph on about herbs, and um, it's basically uh, to address two because somehow we recognize the mind and the gut, where we potentially can help um, uh, through through um, you know stressing through through addressing the stress. Uh, we could potentially help the gut digest and absorb nutrition and therefore giving you more strength and more uh, more ability to um, uh, address the fatigue or potentially lack of energy. So in, in TCM or traditional Chinese medicine, we do have a pattern that fits both um, the stress as well as the mood as well as fatigue. So we view you as a whole, and uh, when we when we do herbal treatments, it's a formula where it combines about eight herbs to potentially address all all, all of the symptoms at the same time. Okay, so um, I guess for you to be prescribed this specific formula, you would really want to talk to someone who is trained in the traditional Chinese medicine that has uh, potential um, prescribing uh, capability to specifically identify the pattern as well as what uh, formula to match it with. Yes. Um, so uh, what herbs or supplement can support kidney health? Okay. And when there are potential drug interactions with uh, history uh, that weren't as rigorous tested. How do we weigh risk and benefit of, of taking them? Okay, so there's two questions. Let's do the kidney first. Okay, so kidney is a filter. Okay, so it basically filters all the blood that's in the body. Okay, it try to get rid of waste through uh, urine. Okay, so if at least do not add more stress to the kidney that can potentially help but um as far as um like what supplements to help kidney um i i hear more what supplement to avoid to increase uh, kidney health than what can basically supports its health um, some herbs has oxalate that can potentially form into kidney stones. Okay, so uh, those definitely <laughs> you want to avoid. Otherwise, like because it's a filter, um, plenty of fluids, water is actually the best, best um, uh, kidney health remedy that you can give to kidney. Um, keeping yourself hydrated and avoid additional stress to um, have the kidney filter, okay? Other, uh, another thing is like potentially uh, supplements that's not, um, you know, being uh, looked or being uh, quality controlled with, you know, potentially heavy metals, those you wanna also uh, avoid as well because um, if if you try to have your kidney do um, like the filtering of heavy metals and and pesticides, potentially that's that's actually can cause more harm. Okay, so before you even take supplements, um, you want to check with the company that makes the supplement whether they look for pesticides or heavy metal. Okay, so um, 
And the second part with regards to potential earth shock interaction. Um, so this is where it's really uh, hard because what happened is there's no regulation to uh, these supplements um, in the, before it's being marketed and sold to the, the patron. And basically you would have to um, either uh, look up their company for their history and see whether they look for clinical trials or at, at least some animal studies to find out whether their product has specific interactions with um, with a drug or otherwise you are you basically do do not have any data so um, when you choose specific supplements you really want to at least uh, find a um, manufacturer that are reputable okay and there is a website that I use personally uh, consumerlab.com that is a third party lab tests uh, sites where they potentially um, look into what is in the content of the products and potentially approve or not approve a certain product based off from the content. Whether it's below what is being marketed, the at least the content, if it's 100 milligrams, and then, and then when they really look into the product, they don't even have that dosage, then uh, you would you would question whether they even look into their products uh, quality assur assurance. So um, dosage is another question that you really want to ask. Um, how much of this compound is in there, and is this compound at this dosage gonna have this interaction? And that might need like um, a lot of uh, further studies. And this is where I actively look in like primary literatures on PubMed and update the, the, the evidence on our website. So at least 288 products, um, I can basically confidently tell you whether there is earth drug interaction, but there's just so many out there, you know, and um, it's best to um, really look into the to the company and what's really inside the product before you can make the risk and benefit uh, assessment. Okay. Um, how, how are we doing? Are these question answer something that um, is, is there I other think, questions? I think we're doing great, first of all, and we thank you for you know, I'm glad we sent you the questions ahead of time. Yeah. And uh, I know it's sometimes difficult when you're not getting, you know, feedback. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so hard. I can um, appreciate that. Does, but, do other people have, I mean, do people have other questions they'd like to ask at this point? Sherry? You consider caffeine a supplement or is it? So, yeah, so caffeine is, if you concentrate it, it can be a drug, you know? So... <laughs> Um, supplement or um, how how much caffeine is in in the supplement that you're taking? Um, it really depends on you know the dosages. Okay, caffeine itself it can be extracted. Okay, um, and be highly concentrated uh, capsule even. Okay, but uh, like depending on the coffee ground or depending on you know if you want to really find out um, um, the I think the newer brands they they do answer those questions like how many caf like how much caffeine is in a cup you know that you can you can really find out from the manufacturer and if they do look for that they really are thinking from the from the consumer's uh, perspective. And hopefully, um, you know, I mean, if you're very caffeine uh, sensitive, then, you know, you can uh, tailor the, the amount of uh, caffeine that you consume daily, you know. Um, 
So it, it is a supplement uh, if, you, if you have enough of it. So, and it, sometimes it can, it can be at a dose where it causes you know, side effects such, such as palpitation, uh, frequent urination, you know, stuff like that. Does it have any specific interactions with the TKIs or any of the chemotherapies, that, if you know, associated with Roswin treatment as a rule? Well, how many cups is one taking? Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, less than 300 milligrams a day. For me, it's less than yeah, that. It's, it's, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. 300 milligrams of caffeine, it works more like a diuretic than something that can be in the bloodstream mm -hmm. where um, it can interact with the, with the drug. So what happens is when you intake caffeine, um, it gets metabolized. Okay, so what's, what's going to be available in the bloodstream can become from 300 to minuscule amounts, okay? And that little amount would not have any way of interacting with the drugs. So that's the bioavailability of caffeine once you eat or uh, take it. And that's the pharmacokinetics that we learn in pharmacy schools. <laughs> Thank you. I think Lee Moore had a question. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, do you have a recommendation for, you know, lowering cholesterol, uh, high cholesterol when you're on lorlatinib? Yes. So first, the diet, um, I'm not sure if there's a way to um, uh, limit the dietary intake, you know, so if you have less to um, go into the body, that's one way. And then because all these statin drugs can potentially interact with, um, you know, the uh, TKI, um, the best way is actually through um, like lifestyle and diet management. Um, and everyone is different, okay? So some people may need um, medication to control the cholesterol, but um, this would be something that's uh, very tailored to, to, to a, a particular patient specific. So I, I wouldn't start right off a supplements, um, uh, potentially that can uh, cause interaction, but um, lifestyle modification would be the first step. Anybody else have a um, question they'd like to ask Jason? Thank you, by the way. Okay. Someone was asking whether green tea was safe to use with TKIs, I noticed in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Green tea. Green tea can be as a beverage or as concentrated as like, you know, there's, there's different compounds that you can extract from green tea, one of which is uh, ECGC, okay? ECGC potentially can lower, lower the liver function test. So it, it's sometimes marketed as like, oh, it's good, antioxidant, but uh, potentially at enough concentration can interact with, um, with TKI specifically. So again, how much green tea are you drinking? If it's just a cup or two, that's perfectly safe. But when you are doing concentrations, concentrated capsules of like 500 milligrams, 1000 milligrams of ECGC, I would be very cautious. I have a question. Sure. There's so many manufacturers on the market today. What do you have any guidance on how we select a manufacturer that would be more pure and more reliable in what's in the little capsule that we're taking? Yes. So first, um, you gotta kind of do uh, some little background research on the company itself. Okay. Um, and 
Again, the consumerlab.com is a third-party lab that does test the manufacturer, the well-known ones, okay? There are so many manufacturers that's out there, okay? And now more and more of them can provide you with certificate of analysis, basically their assessment of their own products. And okay? they could either do it on their own or they outsource it to another company that does the analysis, okay? If they can provide at least some kind of um, transparency to certificate of analysis, that's, that's something to say about that company, okay? And certificate of analysis is tied to the lot number, okay? So when you call a company and you ask, hey, can I get a certificate of analysis of this product? And they say, yes, of course, and send it right to you without asking specifically what lot. That, that's, uh, that's one thing to catch whether they're professional or not because each batch is different, okay? They measure the certificate of analysis according to that batch, okay? So, you know, potentially if this is like a herb, okay? That batch can depend on the season, the soil, whatever, you know? And if they do not ask you for that lot and they present you a perfect, certificate of analysis without really tying to which lot, then you, you, you have to question. So when you ask for certificate of analysis, the company would ask you what lot. And that's how you can tell whether they can be trustworthy or not. And okay, so what is in the certificate of analysis? They usually measure the comp, like if there's, let's say turmeric, okay? What's the active compound in turmeric? Curcumin, okay? And if they say they have 100 milligram or 1,000 milligram, whatever milligrams, and their certificate does not show that, that means they're, they're labeling the, the product wrong. So the certificate of analysis really reflects on what is inside that capsule, inside the tablets. So that's why it, and also they look for pesticides and heavy metals. That's one thing that they also look for. With turmeric, for example, you could get it in powder or liquid. Yes. Do you have a recommendation on when to get a powder or a liquid, or is that too general of a question? So it really depends on your preference, okay? Um, but turmeric as a root is, is like a dietary, um, you know, culinary um, spice that you know, can be used, okay? So it doesn't really have to be in a capsule form, you know? That really is like, um, actually the curcumin in a turmeric can be absorbed better than if you have extracted uh, the compound uh, curcumin itself because it's really hard to be absorbed. The curcumin re require another uh, uh, compound. Uh, it's actually an extract from black pepper called pepperin to help its absorption. So if you're looking for turmeric products, uh, you have to look into the back of the, the label and says whether it has this uh, compound that helps the absorption of cur uh, curcumin or else it basically go right through you, okay? You rather eat the, the root, the turmeric root because uh, with the combination of different compound within the root, it helps the uh, curcumin absorb better. Thank you. Yeah. Any, anybody else speak up now or forever hold your peace? Uh, thank you. It was wonderful presentation. I, I have a question. Yes. Um, there are, at least in my area, many, many TCM providers um, I don't know. I mean, I chose mine based on uh, referrals of people I, I trust, but uh, it was hard actually to figure out how how to navigate who who should I trust to guide me through some of these choices. Do you have any advice on how how to find a specialist? Yeah. So I I can speak for my uh, my our own IMS practice. We actually train our own providers, uh, TCM, okay? And I happen to know both 
Western and Eastern. So I guess unless you know they're also trained in the Western, it's really hard to have a provider that can know the herb drug interaction as um as uh as I do. So it has it has to potentially um you have to look for provider that has both trainings in Eastern and Western. And I think more and more of us are, are, are basically getting dual degrees where they can provide the service of, you know, herb drug interactions as well as uh, the TCM formulas. So uh, MSK is trying to basically, uh, you know, teach or educate these herbal supplements to our providers. So they know at least what's in the formula and how to use it. And um, hopefully there'll be, you know, in the future, group of us where, you know, the oncologist team, the onco team, as well as the outside TCM provider can collaborate. So it's, <clears throat> it's still in the making and the, Herbal dispensary that we started at MSK basically is a start. So until more and more cancer centers start to adopt and use these uh, herbal supplements, and until more studies regarding herb drug interactions are out, you know, we we basically have to rely on a practitioner who has dual degrees that can assess the risk and benefit of using herbs, especially on active treatments. Yeah, so, I mean, NCCLM do have a provider directory, but I'm not sure if all of these providers have a uh, Western science background. So it's, it's, it's basically, you would have to look in uh, um, clinics that has these type of um, uh, Western and Eastern um, settings where potentially the provider in there setting can do the check for you. So um, I, I know the regular mom and pop acupuncture places would not have these um, specific herb drug interaction checks, but you might be surprised. There's one, uh, you know, pharmacy that is like the oldest in Chinatown uh, on Grand Street that has a pharmacist, a CEO, and, he actually uh, quit pharmacy and become a full-time herbalist. And, and it's basically his father's uh, shop and he know both Eastern and Western. So it, you just have to ask and see if they know any knowledge to do herb drug interaction checks. Like if I went to my regular traditional oncologist in Michigan where I live, yeah. You know, I don't know that he knows about all these supplements I'm taking. Right. Uh, how do we, I mean, you're saying to talk to your doctor and that's a great yes. idea, but there seems to be such a gap and I, how do we bridge that gap and what yes. can we do? Awesome question. So, yeah, so we, <laughs> when we have oncologists who have interests in, you know, uh, integrative medicine, uh, they mm -hmm. come through our center to get trained and whatnot. And typically when they rotate through me about uh, about herbs, the website, mm -hmm. I, I would say, yes, we typically would encourage you to speak with your patient and you will be the one making the decision whether to put them on the supplements or not. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, at least for the ones who rotate through me, I would encourage them to really at least keep up with the literature that's uh that's like uh at least um some evidence base that's on some of these supplements there are mm -hmm. growing evidence and yes there is um, there's a lot of research and yes. studies yes and i would highly encourage you to check out our website about herbs and forward those information and um we we like to have this open discussion because yeah um it's because if they tell you to stop on taking anything without a proper reason, you'll you start to like, what else can I do? You know, exactly. And you start to you, you, you potentially can do something 
uh, unsafe. And if you can talk to uh, a healthcare professional who can, you know, really look into the literature and assess yeah. the risks and benefit, that that's like uh, you can make a better and well-informed decision uh, after you assess both sides of the story without, yeah. uh, without you know, just blindly, uh, you know, taking supplement that's, you know, on the advertisement or... or well, you, you gave us a lot of things to be, like, to be aware of, which is great. But do you have a list of, yeah, are, do you have a list of supplements that you know are safe to take with like chrysotinib or intractinib and what they do and do they help? I mean, are they worth, you know, taking at the same time? That's. So, yeah. So uh, everyone is different. Okay. So from a traditional Chinese medicine point of view, we look at disease like on a balance when your disease, you're off balance. Okay. And the point of taking supplements, which almost is like just regular food to, to, to some of us. Okay. Right. It's to rebalance you and it's not to take the supplement forever. It has to have certain uh, efficacy and then you stop because once you exceed that, you know, either over consume or chronic use, that might t tip the balance the other way, you know? Right. So right. it's about what symptom are you trying to address and you talk among your care team and try to target that symptom either okay. through you know, non-pharmaceutical acupuncture massage tai chi or supplements, but you gotta choose carefully now. You know, there are stuff uh, in high level of concentration can interact with yes. chemo drugs. Okay. So, at what point, at what dosage, you have to really, uh, really assess. Okay, yeah. and that you you might need professionals. And right. not all supplements are created equal. Some of the manufacturer would you know, put a few or put a lot in, in a capsule. Right. Okay. Are they honest in what they put into the capsule? You know, that, that's a separate question. That's a very good a point. Quality, <laughs> quality question, you know. Yeah. So uh, which product to choose and how much to choose, you know, uh, yeah. is, is something that you can really go really deep and very personalized for you uh, among, your, uh, among your healthcare team. Mm -hmm. So it's about this, the, the symptom that you would like to take a look at, target that, use a, use a modality, whether non-pharmaceutical or herb, and yeah. for a period of time. And that's, mm -hmm. that's when you can tell whether it works or not. If not, then you've got to switch to something else. Right. Because uh, okay. you, you want that quality of life. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Good question. I have a question about yeah. pro probiotics. Um, probiotics okay yes yes uh, so most most heavily um focused topic uh recently because potentially um our gut microbiota or the probiotic that lives inside us potentially is the source for our immunity okay but it's not about one strand of probiotic it's about the variety of the microbes that lives inside you, that coexist, that that lives with you, mm -hmm. okay? And the way the probiotic work right now or the available products, at most there's 12 strands and that's not, that's not gonna cover all the, all the possible variety that should be living inside you. So, and there, there are some that just cannot be um, cultured, put it in a capsule and you take it and it lives inside. There's some that you need to feed it to let it naturally what about, grow. What about the poop pills that you can take somebody else's? Yes, poop? yes, that's, that's a very specific, uh, that's a very specific uh, regimen, but like not everyone needed that, okay? But as far as how probiotic work, it's basically you gotta feed what's already inside and potentially replenish through like fermented food, you know? There's, a, there's many type of fermented food from each culture. And you can, I'll be encouraged to, 
you know, explore different cultures, uh, fermented food. And that's one way of replenishing, um, prop the, the, the gut bacteria. Uh, and, and like, uh, there are prebiotics or certain, um, uh, medicinal mushrooms that can help, um, you know, live and coexist and help the, the probiotic that's living inside you grow better. What kind of measure? Balanced level. But the, the fecal um, pill, that's, that's a separate, separate specific therapy and a very indicated uh, you know, condition uses that therapy. But for most, fermented food. <clears throat> I do eat kimchi and I do eat um, uh, yeah. sauerkraut. Yeah, um, that's, that's it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't eat dairy anymore, so I, I've, I've given up yogurt. Um, but if, do you have any yeah. other foods that you recommend? As Kefir, kombucha. Um, there's a there's a bunch. There's okay. a bunch. Yeah. What about miso? Miso is good. That's fermented soy. Yeah. Yeah. What about tofu? How do you feel about tofu? tofu? There's there's fermented ones. Yeah. Yeah, there's um there's uh yeah, there's many, many any culture, there's always a fermented like sourdough bread is a fermented thing too, you know. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yep. What do you think about the uh, the metabolic approach? There's specifically something called cancer care oncology, and they tell you to use atorvastin, metformin, doxycycline, and membendazole. My oncologist is on board with it, except the membendazole, because she said it could be too hard on my liver. But <clears throat> they prescribed me the rest. What do you think about it? Yeah, so there are off-label use for indicated drugs. It's very specific to your condition. So I can say in general, it's good for everyone. Uh, you got to see what else is going on in your you know, metabolic um, symptom that can potentially use this, these you know, off-label use of the drugs. Okay? And those are drugs, and in some cases, it can be used, but... You gotta be careful, like at what dose, in what condition, and what is your time frame of checkup and follow ups. Because uh, you cannot just take these forever and not be checked on, especially your liver and your kidney. You know, so all these has to be assessed, and uh, potentially you can reap the uh, the benefits, but uh, mit mitigate the risk. Can milk thistle protect the liver? Well. I mean, milk thistle potentially are inducing or inhibiting a lot of the liver. And because it's known as a detox herb, right? So imagine you're stressing the liver to go put it in overdrive. Put it in okay? So maybe in a short period of time, okay? But it's about what you put into your system. And if you overstress it, you'll eventually give up. So the 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 more basic whole food the better that should be the approach um what about herbal teas i drink a lot of herbal teas sure. is there a, is there too much herbal tea <laughs> so there there are herbal teas in tcm or traditional chinese medicine or like um, some flower or some like sage and stuff like that, right? So yeah, flower as, sage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so those, you know, I don't know if it like um, does too like detox you or like just makes you um, feel you know more awake at, in the morning, but you know it's not gonna be at a such high concentration to take. Uh, to be to be giving you uh, interaction effect. Okay. So 
it's <clears> still in moderation. You shouldn't be drinking buckets of tea or buckets or well, I think we, <laughs> we all we are all supposed to drink a lot. Like I was told, up to drink up to three liters a day. So yes, so I in drink, TCM, I drink a lot of oolong tea in the morning. Nice. But so because I'm kind of tired of drinking water, that's mainly yes. why I drink so oolong it's, tea. Yes. <laughs> So it's a, that's the good idea, the hydration part. Uh, when we when when you go visit a TCM doctor, they will often ask you how often do you go to the bathroom or urination? What color is it? You know, like very very specific, even the color. So when can we tell uh, the practitioner knows that you're drinking enough or being hydrated? Is at least you're going to the bathroom, and the water the the the, the color is you know, clear to yellow clear. If it's too yellow, that means it's like you're not drinking enough. So I'll drink until you're going to pee as well as clear. And that's the, that's the idea, hydration. But if you like to flavor it with like flower tea, oolong tea, that's really good. Uh, there's no, there's, it's not enough to cause any big problem. Okay. Is there a charge for your app? <clears throat> no, it's free. And uh, we're, so I'm an Android user. So I, I want, so I, I, I just, uh, you know, came to MSK like three years ago. So one of my priorities is making this available for Android users. So, so soon, coming this spring, they say, they'll, they'll, make, they'll make the update to be available for both Android and Apple users for free. Oh, so it's not available to Apple right now. It's available already for Apple. It's been available for at least 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's just about herbs. Do you go and present at these doctor's conferences? Uh, slowly but surely, yes. <laughs> we are, yeah. I will be responsible for talking soon. I'm still in training, but you know, I start small. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question in the comments about taking melatonin. How do you feel about melatonin? So before we go to taking melatonin, we gotta get to the bottom of why you're not sleeping. Okay, is your sleeping hygiene good? Are you napping in the morning? I'm Are sleeping because I'm depressed. Oh, and when okay. I when I when I go to sleep, I think about all my problems. Okay. And I'm newly inducted into the Hall of Fame of this website. Okay. By complete shock. I have three little kids and I'm still grasping on what's going on with me. Okay. So the best therapy for sleep. Is actually before you get to the, um, uh, you know, the pharmaceuticals. Okay, it's actually uh, 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 there's a mindful, mindful based therapy, uh, CBTI, cognitive behavior uh, therapy for insomnia. Okay, and this should be the first line of therapy. It basically. Uh, trying to reassess what you can control and not to worry too much of what you cannot control because, um, because it will go into this evil cycle of you cannot sleeping and you wake up really restless and, you know, like, and then somehow the problem didn't get solved and then all these get, you know, worse and worse, okay? It's about trying to take control at least do some exercise, at least do some sleep, at least have a good diet. And that is like the main thing that you need to support for, for life in general. So, you know, the cognitive be uh, behavior change would help you really, um, you know, be in the moment and basically find out where in, you know, in, in your um, habits that can be changed to allow you to go to sleep, allow you to maintain sleep and wake up with, with, um, with, you know, a well night of sleep, including using 
melatonin or other um, uh, remedies. If if like there's bright lights like cell phones, you know, blue lights, the light itself triggers the the decrease in production of melatonin. Okay? Melatonin is something natural you produce from your brain. Okay, it allows you to have a proper circadian rhythm. Okay, by taking uh, melatonin, it replaces what seems to be in in lack of inside you. But before you get to supplementing melatonin, you gotta find out why first you need to, uh, why is there a decrease in melatonin and you need to supplement it? And is there enough uh, of an environment that allows you to have a full night of sleep? So that's something that I would encourage you to uh, find out because sleep is very important. It allows you to really uh, relax and uh, regroup and uh, be less stressed the next day. Hopefully that answers. Thank you. But what about melatonin for other purposes besides sleep? I read a, some mm -hmm. it can be used for um, uh, uh, coverage in your brain for uh, before a scan or for your body in general. I'm not aware of that one. But it's a general antioxidant. We need, we all need it. It's produced by a gland in our brain um, every night when there's no lights. And usually, it's the, it's, it's, it's a, it controls your circadian rhythm. Yeah, and the moment that you turn on a light, it disrupts it unless it's yeah. under red light. Yes. So blue light is the trigger. Yeah. So even, even if you close your eye and if it's like light on the surrounding it penetrates through and you can still sense it and as soon as there's lights um it basically shuts down the production of melatonin so therefore in a good sleeping hygiene environment it's dark everything even the clock light is like out of the room only bed and you sleep in the bedroom that's it sleep or sex that's it <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jason. Hi. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. No problem. Very informative. I've got a question about uh, actually tea as well, green tea in particular. Green tea. Yeah, I was previously on chemo and immunotherapy. And my pharmacist uh, discouraged me from taking the green tea because they kept telling me that uh, there's too much antioxidants in it and it will interfere with my treatment. And I consulted with my oncologist, but my oncologist said it's fine. So anyway, I, yes. I, I took the safe path and didn't really drink the green tea anymore. But now okay. I'm, switching, I'm switching from chemo and immuno to TKI again. Okay. I was... Uh, previous on TKI. So now my question is, uh, how is this green tea thing? Uh, is it going to interfere with the TKI in a significant way? Or is it, as what you said earlier, that uh, a cup or two is not going to cause any big increase in concentration to have any effect? Exactly. And you drink tea to have some joy in life. Okay, that's very important. Do not ever get rid of the joy, the little joy that brings to your life. Okay, so a cup or two is not going to do anything. It goes through you and it, you tear it out. Okay, there is concentrated green tea extract that potentially can interact. That you might want to be careful. It's, it's potentially that that the doctor is uh, want you to be careful of where you kind of just take the ECGC or something very highly concentrated. But just like you know, oolong tea, you know, if you go to like a Chinese restaurant or dim sum, you know, you know, it, it's good to have some decrease, a decrease after yeah. a big full meal, you know, and that's like very pleasant, you know, and 
it brings joy. And first, you guys have to bring some joy to your life. And if a cup of tea or two, that should be perfectly fine. Okay. How, how do you define concentrated uh, ginger tea extract? Yes. So you flip to the back of the, the supplement fact, and they say concentrated ECGC, 500, 2 grams, something like that. Then that is concentrated. That means they use like buckets, buckets of tea leaf. They boil and they use alcohol, ethanol, water, and they extract. They extract and make it really concentrated. So a bucket into a capsule. And that's, you cannot, that is too much. That's too much. That's when you should be concerned. Oh, so you're referring to the ginger tea in a capsule that is to be yeah. avoided. Green tea, green. whatever, whatever extracts, when it's mm-hmm. concentrated like that, you got to really go through a pharmacist, oncologist, doctor, mm-hmm. and see if it's right for you. Mm-hmm. And if you are taking it, you have to be very certain that your liver is metabolizing it. You're not building up. And because you're concentrating the tea leaf, make sure you're not also concentrating the preservative or like the, the pesticides heavy metal inside that capsule as well. So when you take um, a capsule, you got to really think about how that manufacturer made that capsule. So yes. you better off just take the green tea in its original state where the body knows how to get rid of it. You got it. I, I, wanna, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know, Jason, if you want to go past six o'clock or not. We, we want to be respectful of your time. I can, I can have one or more, one or two more questions. And then. Okay, we, we appreciate it. Does anybody <laughs> I, I, have any questions? Yeah, I have a question about um, like if you're taking calcium and, and uh, vitamin D3, should that be spaced out from taking your TKI? So when you take calcium, vitamin D3, that's very specific for you. Potentially you're lacking the, and most Americans are lacking the vitamin D uh, because we're, we're just kind of staying indoors, okay? So there's, there's a blood work that you can actually measure to see if you really need vitamin D supplementation. And why vitamin D supplementation has anything to do with calcium is because we need that to allow the calcium to be deposited into your bones. So it's about your bone health as well. So it's really specific to your situation. If there's a need and um, for vitamin D cal- and calcium supplementation, you need to take those. And the TKI potentially, there's, there's no direct interaction that I see can make that possible. But it's about like, you know, uh, potentially why you are taking the vitamin D and calcium in the first place. And if it's like mission critical, you need to take both, you know, uh, TKI as well as the vitamin D and calcium. But otherwise, in general, you should be getting all your vitamins and uh, minerals from just whole foods. And our body is really good at absorbing nutrition and uh, supplementation is only if you're deplete, if depleted in these uh, uh, vitamins and minerals. So it doesn't matter whether they're taken at the same time or six hours apart? No, yeah. Okay. But measure your vitamin D level and stop your vitamin D supplementation when you don't need it anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Who wants to take the last question before? Hey, hey Jason, I have, a, I have a question for you. Okay. Thank you for your talk today. And I, I, I don't like your advice to say, I, I typed it in the chat window. So oh, uh, my wife is taking a uh, chrysotini right now. And uh, so the regular blood test is actually showing, you know, the uh, ART, AST, and also ARP is uh, gradually uh, going up. Mm-hmm. And uh, for example, the, the range for ART is uh, under 50 or AST is under mm-hmm. 40. So right now it's in the 60. 
Mm -hmm. And the uh, oncologist like say, well, let's say side effect of, of the drug, so it all will be okay. But some other, uh, other patients in uh, other rose one group, they suggest to say you will take, can take something to protect the liver ahead of time, like uh, I typed a uh, milk uh, face to you. some uh, some mm -hmm. other patient actually take it. Is that okay or not? Or, or have any yeah. damage or help? So, um, so the liver function test is a marker for assessing whether your liver is under stress or not, okay? Potentially, it is the TKI. Potentially, it can be something else. Potentially, it could be lifestyle, okay? So I'm not sure if there is a habit that can, you know, be addressed to potentially help uh, decrease the uh, liver function test, like all the levels to come down. But um, I, I'm not sure um, what causes the, the rise in the liver function test, but by taking more supplements is not the way. You got to somehow lift the stress from, from the liver, and that could be anything. Um, so find out what could potentially take out from from you know, harming or stressing the liver out, or, um, you know, there's, I would not suggest supplementing other things to detox the liver, let's say. There's no such, there's no such thing. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Because, you know, some supplement, let's say, actually I help uh, protect your liver or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yes, for, for, for healthy people, maybe. It's basically... It's basically marketing, marketing. So, okay. yes. And there's many of them. Milk thistle is just one, but like, just be careful uh, what you hear or see on the label. And I would encourage you to really talk to the care team and find out what is really causing the, li uh, the liver function test to rise. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jason, we want to thank you for your two really fabulous and very knowledgeable uh, presentations both two weeks ago and today. And as um, the moderator for the Ross Wonder support group, we want to thank you profusely for everything that you taught us.